Uh, okay, so um, the first uh, group for the labs uh, did their lab yesterday, and uh, I think hopefully the second group is on track for 5:30 p.m. today. And uh, um, so, in the in the lab, you're going to start off by measuring some characteristics of a quantum well laser, which is kind of like the one here, and we're going to spend some time discussing that today. Um, Another announcement is on Monday, uh, Professor Cliff Pollock will come by and uh, um, introduce the second lab, which will, uh, the lab will be after uh, the spring break, but uh, he will give an introduction to what it is and, uh, uh, and uh, we'll, um, so the first lab is more of, uh, you're going to take data and measurements, the second lab is going to design it, design something. So, okay. Uh, uh, so we uh, we were kind of motivating in the last class uh, what's the need to go from bulk three-dimensional semiconductor diode lasers to double heterostructure lasers and then to quantized structures, quantum wells, uh, three uh, to 2D confinement or wires and uh, dots and such things. And essentially one of the real motivations is to lower the amount of current you need to inject to make it to laze, to, you know, uh, to, to have stimulated emission, uh, um, to have gain overcome the loss and, 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 and uh, have stimulated emission. Uh, and the, the lower is the current, the more easier it is to miniaturize and be, make it mobile and you know, integrate it on chips and all that kind of thing, right? So uh, what we're going to spend some time today is uh, uh, first look at, uh, uh, say, the quantum well structure and uh, how a quantum well design uh, can help change the gain spectrum and change the threshold. And, uh, um, and the, the, the same philosophy carries over if you want to go to lower dimensions. We, uh, uh, wires where you've, uh, it's a 1D transport or in dots, which is carriers are confined in all three directions now and such things. So, so we'll first look at the quantum well and, uh, and an outline the methods for uh, wires and dots. And I want to end the class today by looking at a laser from a broader perspective where uh, we can say that we have gone through all the microscopic details of engineering, uh, the density of states, uh, and engineering the threshold current. But after all is said and done, you're going to measure, you're going to apply a certain amount, of, push a certain amount of current into the semiconductor diode, and you're going to see a certain amount of light come out. And you're going to measure that in, in the lab, for example. You're going to measure the power output as a function of current injection. That's the end result. That's, so we're going to take a little bit of an engineering uh, look at it and say, uh, it's great that you have designed all the details, but how do I now use it? You know, as a user, how, how do I look, uh, look at it? How, do I, uh, how much power is coming out as a function of th threshold current? And we'll see that we can look at it from a very phenomenological picture and still say a lot of things about it, you know, a lot of things. And in fact, we can say something which the microscopic picture will have a very hard time saying. For example, if I want to turn a laser on and off or modulate it, how fast can I do it? You know? The phenomenological model will tell you that answer very fast, whereas the microscopic model is a much more difficult to get to that answer. So anyway, so we'll look at those two things. So we'll start with uh, uh, the quantum well, uh, uh, and, and uh, we saw that uh, the gain spectrum, the small signal gain spectrum, uh, was uh, the Einstein A coefficient, uh, wavelength square by <coughs> a refractive index and such factors, times the, you had the optical joint density of states, uh, and for units we make sure of we have this, and uh, and then you had the population inversion term here, Fv of E1. I'm going to uh, leave this on the left side as we work through the quantum well structure, uh, where E2 is an energy in the, in the uh, conduction band. And so that's E2. And E1 is a corresponding state in the valence band electron state but it's empty and your transition here is such that the difference is exactly equal to the photon energy that enters the frequency and all that there. So this is E versus K. Uh, 
So whenever I inject, uh, inject an electron in the conduction band, maybe I inject it here at this kinetic energy. So what happens is the electrons will rapidly thermalize, collide with the lattice, and release its energy, and rapidly try to relax to the bottom. But some of them may have not completely relaxed. And uh, so most intense you know, emission is from the bottom of the band, because that's where the population is the highest. The population is going down as you go up in energy as the Fermi function, so on. So once you write this down, all that is taken care of. Now, some semiconductors may not have the lowest uh, point in the conduction band and the highest point in the valence band at the same k. Uh, for example, silicon is a great example. It is a very poor emitter of light. Uh, and the reason for that is the if I inject electrons, it wants to go and at be at the lowest energy, but it's momentum mismatched with the whole state. And so uh, and then these states are filled, and then so there's, this recombination is not allowed because that state is filled, and it doesn't have enough momentum. Light doesn't have the momentum to satisfy this. So it's not a vertical transition. Therefore, silicon doesn't emit light very efficiently. I mean, it does emit a little bit, but not very efficiently. So we're primarily talking about materials that have uh, what you call as a direct band gap. The minimum of the conduction band energy states and the maximum of the valence band energy states are the same k. So that's a direct band gap semiconductor. So OK, so that's what we are, our focus is on. And the question we are asking is, we derived for any such transition, E2 minus E1 is equal to H nu. And we know that E2 goes as h square, you know, the momentum, basically the minimum of the conduction band is at Ec, maximum is at Ev. So this much plus a kinetic energy valence band maxima you know, minus this kinetic energy here. So the sum of those two should add up to the photon energy. So now we're going to ask, uh, uh, so let me write down the relationship that we got that uh, uh, if I write h squared times k squared, k is the 2 pi by wavelength for the electron times a reduced effective mass was equal to the photon energy minus band gap. You know, by this I got by just writing E2 minus E1 is equal to h nu. That's what we got. And this is the point of departure for any dimension. So we did it for three dimensions. If you want to go to quantum wells or quantum wires, we start here you know, and say that what happens when I can find these electrons in a quantum well instead of letting it go and move in three dimensions. So what, what happens if I inject an electron into a quantum well like this? You know? So this is the conduction band minima. I've chosen a narrower band gap semiconductor here and a much wider band gap semiconductor here. So that's the gap. Here's the gap and I inject an electron, it falls into this well. And then uh, I'm going to ask, what is the density of states now? For op what is the optical joint density of states for the carriers that are confined in this well? Right. So my E2 now is in a quantum well. It's not in three dimensions anymore. And uh, E1 is also in a quantum well. And so therefore, the, one, the way I want to look at it now is uh, uh, what are the allowed k states for the electron? You know, because that's what's sitting here. These are the allowed k states for the electron, or in other words, this is the 2 pi over the wavelength for the electron. And once it's in the well, we are going to uh, make an assumption that the well height, it's typically uh, you know, 0.2 EV or sometimes 1 EV, could be three, you know, two and a half electron volts. We are going to make an assumption here that it's an infinite well, just a simple, simple simplification. We're not going to lose much, much physics from there. It's just going to change some numbers here and there. But the physics will not be lost if we make that assumption. You know? So we're going to make the assumption it's an infinite well, and it has a you know, thickness of LZ or L. So let's, uh, uh, let me label this. So this is the Z direction. And I'm, I'm looking at, for example, the conduction band. And though the barrier is finite in height, for electrons, I've injected electrons here. And <coughs> the thickness of this region is, let's call it L sub z. Uh, that's how uh, your uh, book has uh, used. And then you have the valence band too. This is the conduction band edge. This is the valence band edge. And you know, states out here are all filled with electrons. And uh, states out there are empty. I mean, they're, they're available states, but they don't have electrons there yet. And I've, I've injected an electron through current, and it ends up here. Now, uh, the que first question we're asking is, what are the allowed k's, which will tell us also what are the allowed energy eigenvalues inside this quantum well? So my E2s, 
because of quantization now we'll see it won't be all allowed values but it will be discrete right and and the way you find that is i'm going to enforce that the wavelength of the electron in this direction in the lz direction is such that uh, you know, it has a node, it goes to zero at the edges, so it can be, the wavelength can be like that, can be like that, and so on. So that's a wave fitting picture. Just like we were fitting the wavelength n times half wavelength is equal to the whole box, now we just have a much smaller distance, that's all there is. We're looking at the bigger box earlier, now we're looking at a much smaller box here. Right? So that's the quantum confinement picture. So uh, if this was bulk material. If the whole semiconductor had this band gap, it would be the lowest allowed energy would be here. But because of the quantum confinement, typically of the order of a few nanometers, let's say five nanometers as an example, these energies get you know, uh, pushed up. And that you can get directly from here. So I'm going to you know, expand it out and write it in this way now, m star r, and write it in all its components, k along x, k along y, and k along z is equal to the same thing on the right side, photon energy minus band gap. Okay? So that's really our starting equation for all quantum confinement. And now depending upon if I have not confined any orientation, any direction, then all three go as, you know, this goes as 2 pi over the length of the whole, you know, uh, of the crystal along the, sorry, I said pi over uh, this times an integer. Let's label it as nx. This goes as ny times pi over ly, and nz times pi over lz. That's always true. Well, all we're saying is lx and ly, for my situation now, if I'm looking at it physically, I have a wafer in hundreds of microns or larger. But inside it, I've put in this really thin sliver of a quantum well of thickness LZ. The other two directions, that's still LX in hundreds of microns. That's still LY, hundreds of microns. But this is LZ. It's very thin, few nanometers. And that's the uh, quantum confinement. And then uh, in pictures, uh, here are, these are multiple quantum wells. If you just consider one of them here, that's, for example, one of these wells in a few nanometers. Uh, or a few monolayers, for example. That, that's how it, in pictures it would look, you know, the atomic arrangement and all that. So uh, what we can now uh, uh, say is, uh, if this is so, then uh, how do I find my joint density of states? And that's really the question we are after. So if LX is large, so this still forms a dense set of points in the k space. If I were to go back to k space, initially we had a spherically symmetric k space. You know, LX, LY, LZ, all were very large. and the modes were spaced along the kx direction or ky direction and kz direction by the same amount. I mean, so, and they were very close. The moment I confine it in one direction like this now, what I do is, is my kz is now pi over lz. And that thing is you know, three orders of magnitude smaller than these two. So the mode spacing in the kz direction suddenly increases by a huge amount because it's sitting in the denominator. So this is really not representative, but this is very small. That is very small, kx and ky. But the kz is actually very large now. Their mode sp spacing is huge. Now. So in terms of, if I were to do a, uh, you know, a slightly uh, different picture of that, uh, or let me draw a bigger picture for this. So the mode spacing for, ele uh, for electron states now, So, uh, so I have uh, spacing in the x and y direction, which is very dense. You know, these grid points. And now, uh, uh, again, I mean, so I'm going to look at a uh, 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 circle here, and so, you know, which is part of that. When when this is constant, so we're going to look, those states have equal energy. But the next set of such discrete grid points, it, you know, it's 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 a quarter of a circle. The next set of points is really far out here. You know? So, so that, that's what we really are trying to say. Next set of points in the z direction is kind of far out there. <clears throat> and it's also, again, discrete like that. And, and physically, a mode here, for example, is related to a transition like this. 
So you have a ground state for the holes, so it's a transition like that. A mode there is related to transition from the second excited state to the second excited state here and so on. So that's, uh, uh, that's what the mode spacing does. So in summary, this is pi over LZ or the quantum well thickness now. So now if you want to ask how many states are there between an energy, you know, E plus DE or between an energy H nu and H nu plus D nu. So that's the, how many states are there in this window of energies in the mode space. We can go, go there and find that out. The way we're doing within sphere is we're looking at a little shell and looking at, I go to a certain energy in this direction and then go, go out a little bit further and, and then essentially that shell will find how many points fall inside that shell. For the quantum well, same thing except the shape is different now. It's a cylinder, so the, 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 the surface is a cylinder, not a spherical surface. And we're going to ask now, how, if I go out here, this energy is h square kx square plus ky squared over two times effective mass reduced. Just that term, just these two. And just for argument's sake, I'm going to label it as k parallel, which is kind of in plane or parallel, just you know, for economy of expression here, this k parallel in the plane. And then the kz part is really giving you these discrete slices in the k space. Uh, and uh, so I'm going to go out a little bit in k, k parallel. And this little window here is going to be dk parallel. You, know? so you can write it as square root of dkx square plus ky square, but it's a little uh, circular slice. And we're going to look at that shell. We're going to find the total number of states in the volume. So I'm going to extend it out here, extend it out here. And now I have a very thin cover for that cylinder. And now I want to count how many states are there inside that shell, you know, maybe here and here. That's, that's what we are after. That's, that is the joint. Physically, that is the row jo joint density of states here. How many states are there in that little window? So you can kind of, actually I can w w just pause for a moment. So is this clear? Uh, what you did really was you changed the mode spacing in the K space. Now we are, but we're asking the same question. What is the joint density of states for this new mode spacing? And that's the effect of any quantum confinement. Anytime you quantum confine, you're going to do that. Right? Uh, and if you go to, instead of uh, quantum well, where you confine in one direction, if you confine in two directions, you get a quantum wire. You're going to change this in a slightly different way now. You, you have you know dense set of spacings in only one direction, but you have many of them in the other two. So these are lines instead of surfaces now. Yeah. So, so we are, what we are asking now is I'm going to take this shell, you know, thin shell outside, the sheath of it, you know, around the cylinder, and how many po you know, discrete points lie inside there. Right? And that, that I think we can do geometrically. And then uh, 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 what we'll uh, say is, 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 is if I look at the shaded area here, the base of it, the shaded area is, <coughs> Uh, let's say uh, I take 2 pi k, uh, that's the circumference times the thickness of it. You know, that would be if I had the whole circle, meaning you know, the, the circumference would be 2 pi k parallel all around. Uh, the, 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 uh, so this, this uh, I think what I label here is the energy of any state, kx, ky, that's, uh, you, know, you can write down the energy of that state. But this is the area of that little sheet, but there's only one fourth of it because, you know, well, uh, we're looking at the first quadrant here. And we are uh, saying that uh, this is how many, what is the total area of that uh, little sheet. But the, I don't want the area, I want the volume. I also want the height. Uh, uh, so the area times the height is the total volume and the height happens to be pi over LZ, right? That's, that's the height. So that's the total volume in the case space and uh, you can check it would have units of k cubed. So you have k, k, and this is also k. One over length is k. So the volume units. So that's just the uh, total volume. Uh, and uh, now the total number of states inside there is this thing divided by how, how much volume does one state occupy. Right? And what is the volume that one state occupies? It is always the same. It's pi over Lx, pi over Ly, 
and pi over LZ. That never changes. It's always like that. That's the volume occupied by one state. And in pictures now, if I were a you know, very small you know, uh, square here, it's a very long, uh, you know, uh, like a, with a square cross section, but a very long volume like that. Does it make sense? So uh, now uh, that's how many states are there in that volume. But we know that each state can hold two electrons because of spin. So we're going to put that back in, two spin. Sometimes you may have semiconductors like you know, graphene or other 2D materials where you have many valleys. So you have another valley degeneracy. But those things are details I don't want to get into. With typical 3-5 semiconductors, we have only one valley. So uh, if you have other degeneracies, if you have more conduction and valence band minima, so you can add them. If you have other things, you just keep adding. But just the physical picture here is you, you can count whatever degeneracies you have, this is the place to put them in. Right? This is where you put it in. Right? So that's the uh, uh, total number of states. It's not the density yet. It's the total number of states in, that, uh, 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 in, 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 the, in the case space. And <clears throat> What we are going to do now is ask uh, uh, the total, uh, the, the, the joint optical joint density of states we have talked about earlier is really not the total states, but it is the total number of states per unit volume. Right? That, that, so, so we're going to actually divide this thing uh, uh, by the volume of the, uh, of the uh, quantum well. And now what is the volume of the quantum well? The volume of the quantum well, which is the active region here, Right. Is, is basically the thickness times the area, right? LZ times LX times LY. That's always the volume. So we're going to divide this whole thing. Let's write it 1 over LX, LY, LZ. And you can see that that's the reason the volume will all just go away. But what will remain is the quantum well width. That will remain here. Right? So that's your rho, gen, rho. Let me write it in this way. Uh, this is essentially your density of states in K space. And it's exactly equal to the density of this in energy space. So I'm going to write it like this. So this is my, what I wrote here is rho in the k space dk is equal to rho joint density of states in the frequency space, you know, times d or energy space d h nu. And we have to have that h here because it's energy. Number of states doesn't change if you go from one state to another. So that, that that's conserved. And uh, uh, the next step you do is uh, you say, well, uh, OK, I want to convert the k into energy or into frequency of the photon, nu. How do I do that? Here's your answer. I mean, this is where you go and say, well, here's my relationship between the frequency and the k's. So I go here and I find, can I find this term k parallel, dk parallel? And the answer is we, we can do that by taking a derivative on both sides now. Right? Look at that. Uh, and let me write that down. So we get reduced mass k parallel square. I'm combining the x and y together to write this k parallel here. Plus kz squared h nu minus eg. That's how this equation looks. And uh, uh, I'm going to do now uh, an important step, which is move this thing any direction you're going to quantize in, it's going to give you kind of your floor, your, your potential energy, if you might, is going to change. Your potential energy initially was the conduction band edge, and we are, it's not going to be that. It's quantum confinement is going to push it up. And this is the term that's going to give you that, that information, the quantum confinement energy. Right? So we'll give you h k squared by 2 times reduced mass is equal to the photon energy minus band gap minus or let me write it this way, band gap plus, I put it inside brackets now, basically a square kz square by 2m, but I'm going to expand it out. I'm going to write it as a square by 2 times, let me write the whole thing out so that it becomes completely clear what I mean by this. Oops. Yeah, LZ. Okay, and that's the whole uh, complete uh, equation now. So, <clears throat> so what happened is the KZ is we know that it's it's now uh, 
uh, because of quantum confinement, it, these are the only values allowed where n's are integers and lz is the thickness of the quantum well. And so uh, I take that quantity, take it to the right, and these, these are integers. So, uh, um, and when you do quantum confinement, the one integer that is not allowed anymore is zero. So nz is one, two, three, and so on. The reason zero is not allowed is it's a trivial mode. Basically, you have no electron state. I mean, the, there's no wave function to talk about at all. So, so that's not allowed. But one, two, three, four are all allowed. So the minimum value is one. There is one here. And part of this extra energy here, so you see the band gap is now looking bigger. This is the band gap of the semiconductor, which is just that. But then you have a little bit of a kick from the conduction band, and that term is here. This you can maybe write it as E sub n. This is a little quantum confinement energy in the conduction band. And here's the quantum confinement energy from the valence band. Maybe write it as E sub p, or something like that. So and, then, and that's because the valence band state also gets pushed out because of quantum confinement now. Right? And uh, uh, so now those two numbers, uh, as you, if you put in nz is equal to 1 NZ and 1 and 1 here, then you will get perhaps maybe 10 MeV or 20 MeV. So maybe this will be 20 MeV and that will be 10 MeV, milli electron volts. You can put n is equal to 2, that's also allowed. Then you go to the next state. So n is equal to 1, nz is equal to 1 is going to give you that state, nz is 2 will give you that state, and so on, similarly for holes. And you can just plug those in and check. So, any questions here? Or I just want to, that's clear. So you just uh, quantum confined and you push the states out. And you can see this is an extremely powerful tool because you can now say that, you know, I am not overly concerned with getting the exact band gap of the semiconductor because I can control the photon energy by just changing the LZs now, the thickness, right? I can change the quantum well thickness from 4 to 5 or 6 nanometer, and I can go from maybe, you know, blue to green wavelength of light. So I can do that engineering here at this point, at this point, by just changing the thickness. But you have to be very careful and design it correctly using this, this idea, right? Okay, so these are constants as far as, you know, this uh, whole uh, density of states picture goes. This is a variable k, and, and nu is a variable. So you can take a derivative on both sides and say, uh, you know, it's square k parallel dk. So I'm just taking, you know, a, di a differential of this, and I get m star r, the two comes and cancels on the left, is equal to h times d nu, right? Because all these things are constants. They don't, when you take a derivative, they go away, right? And, and now you can take this. Uh, so you get m star r over h bar squared, right? And there's an h here too. So you can take this and just plop it in here into this expression, right? k parallel d parallel. And you then get, uh, you know, and, and write all your, uh, you know, bas basically you get your uh, joint density of states from that expression right away, right? And the row joint density of states for, for a quantum well or in two dimensions, it is exactly equal, so let me write that down. It is equal to the reduced effective mass over pi h bar squared times the quantum well width in the denominator. And what you'll get here is a unit step function. And let me write that down. All right, so uh, rho joint density of states for, let me write it, two dimensions or quantum wells, you know, it's a function of frequency. So that's, uh, that you get uh, once I substitute, uh, substitute. And I think the unit step function, you see that uh, if your photon energy is smaller, if the photon energy is any smaller than the, you know, the minimum here, then there's nothing, I mean, no absorption. Just like the band gap used to be the cutoff here, uh, this band gap plus the quantum confinement, that's the cutoff now for you. It's going to get shifted. Right? So that's the rho joint density of states. How does it look in pictures? Or quantitatively, uh, it's more is the reduced effective mass, which is 1 over m star conduction band plus 1 over uh, if m star valence band. The more is the reduced density, uh, is the joint density of states. The thinner is the well, the larger is the value also. So, and the units of this are exactly the same as we had found for three dimensions, and you can check that. I'm going to sketch it. A plot of it would look like the following. 
uh, when we plotted the three dimensional density of states, row joint density of states, in the three dimensions it looked like a square root. It went as a square root of photon energy minus the band gap. If I make a plot of this, uh, first things first, is it, it, it will start at a larger energy, not at the band gap of the semiconductor, but a quantum confinement is going to push it out, out a little bit like that. Okay? And you're going to have a step, and then it will be constant. And what is the value of the constant is just that. So the constant here will be m star r over pi h bar square lz. That, that's what's going to look. But that, that's one, what is called a one subband. So it's basically for this transition, for this to this. If I go to the next one, you know, from here to here, for example, that will have an exactly same copy, but with n is equal to 2 instead of 1. So the second quantized state, the second eigenvalue. And then you'll have another step, just like, I'm going to erase this for a second, just, uh, just like this. It will start out at a higher energy, because when you put n is equal to 2, you have a larger quantum confinement energies. And it's going to start out here, perhaps. And we have another step like that, and so on. So it'll be a staircase picture for two-dimensional quantum wells. So the joint density of states will go like staircase. Uh, and uh, uh, okay, so let's look at a very quick uh, uh, plot of this. And I know you're going to uh, do this by yourself for your assignment. I uh, uh, here's how it looks. So let me turn down the Fermi functions now, and then just look at the joint. You know, uh, I'm plotting the gain function now. Uh, the gain function, which is, you know, this taking this row joint density of states, putting it in here, and plotting the whole gain function of the uh, quantum well, right? And and then that's how it looks. Uh, uh, so here's the band gap of the semiconductor, and you see it's kind of zero. And gain is inverse of loss here. You know, it's uh, and and uh, what we are really plotting is the joint density of states, but it's not flat. It's going down because the wavelength. There's also a wavelength dependence here. Wavelength is one over frequency. So actually, what you have a one over frequency square dependence. So that's kind of going down as the frequency goes up. So you actually, the joint density of states is flat, a step, another step here. And, and the energy dependence is in the denominator. So it kind of goes like that. And uh, uh, this is a 10 nanometer quantum well. You can, you know, and I'm going to play uh, 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 the epitaxial game, meaning I'm going to change the quantum well thickness now. When I decrease the thickness, these two energies will go up, uh, and, and, and the quantum confinement will go up, and therefore the band edge is going to go up as well. So you can uh, you know, track that, how they're moving as you quantum confine it further and further. So it's essentially pushed out. Uh, sorry, I don't see the x-axis. OK, that's in electron volts. Here's the band gap of the semiconductor from, where, from which you have formed the quantum well. And we'll bring it down, maybe. Uh, and now, once you inject carriers, uh, let's say the conduction band, you move the Fermi level of conduction band in there, and, and now the gain function changes because now I'm increasing the FC, uh, and uh, then I put the valence band Fermi level in the, uh, or sorry, the FP into the valence band, go negative, and then you start recovering gain now. Right? You get switch as sign. And finally, if you inject enough carriers, both into the conduction band and into the valence band, you will get a gain spectrum that will also mimic the staircase feature of the joint density of states that we are sketching here. You know? So it will start looking like that, the gain spectrum of the semiconductor quantum well. You know? So and then again, uh, 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 right. So just as an example, this, this looks, if it looks much like a theoretical construct, you can go and uh, measure how it actually looks. Uh, and here's the gain spectrum measured for a quantum well structure. You can see it's actually not quite different. I mean, you can see the staircase feature. Uh, but there's some amount of broadening, and that happens because the quantum wells are not quite, you know, not exactly the same thickness everywhere. There's some fluctuations in the thickness, so there's always a little bit of broadening. But that's experimental data now for gain. And I think you can, this model directly simulates it you know, and, and tells you the order of magnitude and all that. So, OK. <laughs> Okay, so uh, 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 I, I, uh, so so that's how you go to uh, 2D, and I'm going to just write down the result for 1D. I'm not going to derive it, but that's something you're doing in your assignment um, when you quantize it, not just in uh, uh, you know the z direction, but let's say uh, I'm going to redraw this a little bit. Now this is a quantum wire uh, where uh, you can have a bulk material, but inside it now 
uh, let's say I'm going to put in a very thin, uh, a, a very thin quantum wire that looks like this, you know, and then this this thing has uh, dimensions in this direction of L x, in that direction of L y, and these are both in few nanometers now, but L z is maybe very long, microns or maybe millimeters too, a carbon nanotube or something like that, you know, I mean semiconductor gallium oxide nanowires, so that there. So now what happens is uh, uh, I think you can go back to your kind of master equation again. You say, well, now these two are very small, so these will only cause quantum confinement, and this will get me my you know, dense set of points in K space, right? So I'm going to do that. And when I go through the same process as I did for 2D uh, and for 1D quantum wires, uh, I'll get a, a row joint density of states as a function of frequency that looks, uh, let me, Sorry, write it uh, this way. Uh, so uh, it, it uh, I think you can say, say right away that if I had only LZ here, now I must have LX, LY because I have confinement in two directions. I get a LX, LY here. And uh, I will get a reduced mass over H bar squared, but I get a one half power here. Uh, you know, similar factor as this, but uh, with a one-half factor. And we're going through the same process as we did here, take a derivative and th do that sort of thing. And, and then what I'll get is one over photon energy minus band gap plus all my quantum confinement energies here. So, so that's how it's going to look. That's the row joint density of states for a 1D situation. The area or the cross-sectional area of the quantum wire is in the denominator band parameters, effective masses, band gap, quantization energies are all here, photon energy is here. So, so that's your joint density of states for 1D quantum wires. And here's a plot of the total gain if I were using quantum wires with that function of joint density of states. Plug it in for 1D and now you make a plot of that and it has a very peaky behavior, meaning it has very sharp resonances when you hit the band edges now. So what we started with was a kind of a, you know, graceful, I mean, kind of r uh, smoothly increasing density of states for 3D. You go to 2D, you have these steps. And in 1D, now what I'm saying is I'm going to actually look like this. It's going to go down as 1 over square root of energy. 1 over square root of energy. It's going to start at a quantum confined level and it's going to go down as 1 over that. And then again, I'm going to hit another level perhaps with n is equal to 2, you know, and nz or nx and yz2, I'll hit another level. Just like I had staircases here, I'll get these steps here. And finally, if you go to zero dimensions, you get, it's a quantum dot, so it's an atomic-like system, and the density of states is very sharp. It's, you know, delta functions. I'm not talking about that right now. Uh, and, okay, so here's the one, uh, 1D structure, uh, and, and here's your, I've just put in again as an example gallium arsenide, I'm starting with a 15 nanometer in both directions, meaning that's very large actually, 15 nanometer here, 15 nanometer here, and here's how it looks, uh, the band edge of the bulk material is 1.4 EV, but you're kind of, here's the one over square root if you might, so, so it's, it's, I've not injected carrier, so that term is negative. So I'm, what you're seeing here is, in that picture, is this thing plotted upside down because negative. Row, row joint density of states and that factor is negative, so you're kind of seeing that. And then I inject carriers, I'm going to flip it and bring it back up. So, you know, again, if I, if I change the thickness and I make it smaller, I, I again push out my quantization energies, right? Uh, as I reduce my thickness, I am as Lx comma Ly is going down, this thing is going up, right? This part is going up because, again, form confinement aspects here. And finally, again, I can inject electrons and holes and, and uh, uh, you know, recover my gain spectrum. Uh, if I just inject electrons, not much is happening, still loss, but once I inject holes together and, and then you can recover your gain spectrum. And uh, here's the first you know, quantized state, and here's the second quantized state, and then finally you end up in loss anyway. I mean, this is your FC minus FV. You can estimate so. 1.86, and if you take this, you know, minus this, we should be here. So. Okay, 
So, uh, and, uh, so all right, I'm going to just write down the thing for quantum dots. Uh, this is 1D. Uh, quantum dots would be 0D, uh, joint density of states as a function of frequency. But it's an atomic-like system, and it, what it looks like is 2 over the volume of the box, so the quantum dot, LX, LY, LZ. And what you have here now is EG minus, uh, you know, let's call the Dirac delta because a sharp function, you want to just have something like that uh, for a quantum dot. Uh, right, so th that's the nature. So, so these are discrete uh, points of steps. And that's like an atomic system. Quantum dot is an artificially engineered atom. So in an atom, you know, your proton and electrons give you certain energy levels, E2s and E1s. In a semiconductor, it's completely designer. You design it. You design what is the nature of that atom right? or the transition by changing the distances and the thicknesses of this layer, right? So, so uh, that's the freedom for quantum dots. Generally, the challenge is it's somewhat hard to control it uh, very accurately. Um, and 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 you you end up with even you know, fluctuations will cause quite a bit of inhomogeneous broadening, which is never you know a big so it's a big problem. Inhomogeneous broadening of a quantum dot is generally a big problem. I had some pictures of quantum dots in the slides. Okay, so these are quantum wells, some wells from our lab. Here's a quantum dot. So essentially, it's a few nanometer size. You can see the height of this is perhaps like four or you know maybe eight nanometers or something like that. It's a pyramidal sort of pyramid here. And the width. so this is a quantum dot. This has much smaller band gap than all the surrounding matrix. And you just don't just have one dot. You have an array of dots. And once you, uh, uh, because the gain, the you know, maximum peak gain uh, uh, kind of increases as you go to wires or dots compared to the bulk value, what happens is because the peak gain is larger, you can lower the threshold that you need to make it to lace. And that's why you're lowering the threshold currents as you go to wells and wires and dots. And that's really the question. Yeah. Um, shouldn't the delta function be dependent on H mu? Oops, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> of course. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> we are talking about the joint density of photons, so. Yep, absolutely. Yep. <clears throat> So yeah, the photon energy, we, yeah. Thanks. Oh, okay. So um, uh, what I want to say is, uh, now this looks like you know we can't go wrong. Just make it smaller, but not. We have to be a little bit careful. What you're going, what you're doing is as you reduce the size of the region, which can give you gain, you're also reducing the total volume over which you can get the gain. You know, you, you have fewer you know, volume, and as a result, there's, there's a compromise, meaning you, are, you may be increasing your density of states, you may be increasing what's called oscillator strength, because the electrons and holes, once they are very close to each other and confined, you really increase their uh, probability of, of recombination or reduce the spontaneous emission lifetime, if you might, make them recombine faster. But at the same time, uh, the game is the following. As you make it smaller, you have very efficient recombination, very efficient stimulated emission, but you have very few photons because the volume is so small, because that's, you know, the source is so small. So there's a trade-off between the two. You, know, you, you, you cannot just go all the way down to a very sparse uh, you know, array of dots. You have to have a lot of dots very close to each other, for example, if you want enough photons. If you're doing a single photon emitter, no problem, use one dot. Right? But if you want to have a high power laser, high power means a lot of volume and a lot of you know, uh, photons, and then you, then, then you have to have uh, this, this slight, uh, you know, th th this is one of the trade-offs of going to lower dimensions. Uh, yeah. So, <coughs> should density of, uh, density of states of the one the quantum wire also shows that? Yes, yes, indeed. So, uh, what's inside here is, you know, all these quantization energies depend on, a, you know, a quantum number, which is an integer. So, when you put n equal to one, you have one step. n equal to two, you'll have the second. So you know, every higher uh, excited state will lead to another replica of, you know, you'll have one here, that will kind of go down as one over square root of energy. And then when nz is equal to two, you have the second eigenstate, it will be exactly the same as this, but now it will add because you have an extra, you know, if the photon energy is here, then it has an extra subband, so it will basically add to this one. Just like for here, it added like that. It's the same thing except it just shifted and you are adding them on, right, onto each other. Similarly, here you will add. It will have steps. 
and, and that's what we see in the simulation. So I'm yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So, for example, for the quantum well, uh, for the quantum wire, the E n is equal to eight square by twice the reduced mass of the conduction band, right? And that's exactly similar to this. Is that what you mean? Ah, I see, I see. I just wrote it like this. Okay, let me, <laughs> okay, let's write it like this for over subbands. Meaning you take the same form, you, in one term you write n is equal to 1, right? Pi over Lx, nx squared, uh, you know, some details. Right? And then the same form you have to add to it, plus the second term with n is equal to 2 and so on. That's how you do it. So the density states will always add for every subband there. Yeah. So those those channels are called, would be called subbands, and we cover a lot more of this in 407 and other courses in solid state physics. But uh, uh, we, since we are constrained in time for this course, uh, this is as far as I want to spend time on this. You know? But uh, indeed, you have steps, and the steps are because of uh, various eigenstates. <coughs> okay, so. Uh, uh, in the last five minutes, I just want to outline uh, what I meant a little earlier uh, by saying, uh, all right, so, so uh, a, a, a real a semiconductor quantum well laser, which you are measuring, for example, in your lab, uh, has, uh, you know, there'll be a quantum well. This is a seven nanometer well. And that's your gain medium. But you see, instead of the whole semiconductor, your gain is in only over seven nanometer. So the photon mode, you know, if you're emitting the photon and it's going to get wave guided and you have facets, uh, you have gain inside, but the gain medium is not covering the entire region where the photons are, you know. And this factor, you know, uh, because you have a quantum confined, very thin layer where you have gain, whereas the photon spreads out, it doesn't care where it was generated, you know, right? So the photon spreads out, and therefore, if your gain, the net gain is gamma, uh, let's say, you know, gamma not nu, you calculate from there, but there's a factor here, you know, another factor which tells you what is the overlap of the photons with the gain medium. What factor of the photon medium, I mean, the electromagnetic spectrum of the photon density kind of moves like that. That's roughly the wavelength of the material inside the semiconductor, for example. So there's a factor gamma which tells you what is the portion of photons that are inside the wells and what is the portion of it outside, right? And this is E is the electric field, square of it is the intensity of the photons. And this factor is uh, uh, so essentially we're saying that only those photons that are inside this shaded region are going to see the gain because otherwise, I mean, they're not in a gain medium. The outside, uh, outside of that well, sorry, if th this is not a gain medium. It's only this region and therefore only a fraction, you can only get a fraction of the gain. So here's the trade-off. What we are saying, you go to quantum confined structures, you can boost your density of states, but you get hit by this one because now photons, don't get confined to nanometers. They will get, you know, hundreds of nanometers. So this is the confinement factor. And the trade-off is actually positive if you go to lower dimensions, but you have to play the game right. You have to make sure that the confinement factor, photons are still inside that thing, you know, I mean, inside the gain medium. Otherwise, you can get a very large gain, but it's not going to help you because most photons are outside. They're not seeing it. So, so that's the trade-off typically in many of these lasers. And one of the things to kind of turn it around, and uh, uh, so I just want to say, for example, the gamma could be 10%, 20%, depends. Uh, if you have engineered it very carefully, maybe a little more. Uh, whereas this, when you go from a 3D to 2D or 1D, you can have maybe a factor of 20 or 50 increase. So you still can win you know, if you go to low dimensions. But you uh, have to design it carefully. That's, that's what I meant to say at this point. Yeah. Uh, now, the, uh, uh, the second thing is um, some of the lasers are not, uh, uh, f when you want to integrate them on a chip, sometimes you want light not to come out from the side or the edge facets, but from the top. And that, that sort of a laser would be called a, a vertical cavity surface emitting laser or a VIXEL. And the, here's the funny, it looks like a complicated diagram, but here's this, uh, you know, uh, uh, you, in, so here, in, in a normal semiconductor, the light goes sideways and the facets are sideways. Here, you have put your mirrors on top and on bottom, instead of on the side of the wafer, and instead of the 
mirrors being on these two sides. Now the mirrors are here and here. That's where we put the mirror. So you want the light to go like that. You know, the cavity is that way. And you let through a little bit, and so the light comes out from the top, or vertically, from the top. So vertical cavity. So the cavity is in the vertical direction. And, and, and this can be very useful because there's an array of them. You can have you know, 10,000 lasers next to each other. And, and uh, you can have a photonic, dense photonic integration uh, in, in, in this fashion. So, so the active region is still quantum wells, but you have these mirrors on top and bottom. And these mirrors, many times, are just super lattices. These are, you know, uh, for example, it's, it's, it's a structure like this. That could be a mirror if you design it right. You know, it's, it's a refractive index. It's changing periodically, so you gap out some photon states. It, those are details, but I just want to say that here, you can turn the photons around and go out from the top. So it's a vertical cavity laser. OK, so we can end here. On Monday, uh, I'll spend uh, maybe 20 minutes discussing about a laser from a completely engineering perspective, completely oblivious of all the quantum mechanical details and all that. And we'll see that we can say even more things about the laser by, by a very simple an analogy to you know, water filling a bucket and all that. So we'll do that. And we'll end uh, this part of the, you know, the chapter 11, for example, with, with this topic on Monday. And uh, again, those who came in late, Professor Pollock would be here on Monday and pass around a sheet for signing off for the second lab, uh, which will be after the break. And uh, I think most of you have signed up for the first lab, and first group has done it. So if you haven't, please let me know. And uh, uh, see you some of, some of you at 5.30 today. Oh, office hours. Sorry. Some of you asked for office hours. I am available over the weekend. I will drop an email. Uh, and I'm available on Monday, too. So I'll drop an email on few time chunks for office hours. Okay?